This is the mapping of Indian states from the time we had 962 princely states and provinces to what we know as India and Bharat today. Please welcome on stage Dr. Sanjeev Chopra. Uh, so friends, what I am going to be talking to you about is how, the, how India has evolved from 1947 to now. You see, when India became independent, in fact, let's also accept the fact that this entire Himalayan region, at some point of time in the geographical imagination or in the civilizational imagination was the Mahabharat and the Gita starts with a, with a quote. In fact, the first very sentence in the Gita is a question which uh, Dhritarashtra asked Sanjay. Sanjay, please tell me which armies are there on the side of the Kauravas and which armies are there on the side of the Pandavas, which shows that even at that point of time, there was an idea that although the concept of Bharat and Mahabharat is established, within Bharat and Mahabharat there are several, several armies, there are several states, several regions, several principalities. And of course you are aware that uh, after the freedom movement by 1946, when it was clear that India has to be divided between India and Pakistan, uh, the maps of the two countries were drawn up. And I'll take you through these, through 11 maps are there, but because we have only half an hour, I can only talk to you about four or five significant maps uh, that have altered, uh, that the maps do not alter a territory, but maps tell us how the imagination of a nation takes place. You see, because what happens is that while anybody can print a calendar or a poster or whatever, as far as the currency note is concerned or the map is concerned, it's a sovereign symbol. A map, a flag, a coin, these are sovereign symbols which are the preserve of the government and it's only the government which can produce these things. So what we are going to do now is that I want you to take a look at this first map of India and what you will notice is that not one state or province or territory or area is the same as it was in 1947. So in 1947 you find Hyderabad. Hyderabad is not what it is today because Hyderabad is Andhra Pradesh. Punjab is not as it was as it as it was then. You have, you see here, uh, Madras states. There's no such thing as Madras states today because all these have been merged. So what the point that comes up, uh, comes up is that in 1947, India were nine provinces and 562 princely states. There were 11 provinces in British India of which two were divided, that is, Bengal and Punjab were divided into East Bengal and West Bengal and East Punjab and West Punjab and two of the provinces, Sindh and the Northwest Frontier Province, they went to Pakistan. So nine provinces were there and there were 562 princely states and getting them all into one uh, consolidated union of India was a big challenge and a big task because all these 562 states had different levels of administration. You had very liberated and very modern uh, states like Mysore, which Mysore incidentally had got its legislative assembly in the year 1882. And that was a, I mean, it was the first legislative assembly in the country. So you had, you had places like this and then you had places which were, which were absolutely backward places where Begar and Reeth and you know, all sorts of crazy things were happening. So the first task for India was that how do we get these 562 states together and how do we start looking at India? In fact, I must share with you that the name which the Britishers preferred for India was Hindustan. The Britishers wanted to leave us as Hindustan and Pakistan because if that was the way they would have left us, it would have meant that British India no longer exists, India no longer exists, India is now Hindustan and Pakistan. Mr. Menon understood uh, the significance of retaining the name of India. That is why we kept the name of India and then we add in three years time, except for three states, that is Jammu Kashmir, Hyderabad, and Junagar, 559 states signed the instrument of accession uh, within, a f I mean, before, uh, on and around 14th and 15th of August, common uh, agreement was signed. These three states were a bit, uh, it, was, it was a bit of a challenge for us to get, to integrate these states. But let us look at the next map of India, which is 19, uh, which is now, you see, 1950. In this map of India, you begin to see Almost you can see India is looking almost as, as now because some regions, some states, some areas are beginning to look familiar because all the princely states have been integrated. The princely states have either been, the bigger 21 gun salute states, they have been made into 
I mean, they have been made states. In fact, another thing which I wanted to show is on the masthead. You see here, it says India, Indian states under the new constitution. Because in the previous map, it was, uh, it was, it said provinces, states and districts. So, provinces referred to the British Indian states and states referred to the princely states and districts were of course districts. So, here you find a major change and, and one more thing which I want to show you here. Uh, Shekhar uh, talked about Himalayas, talked about China, talked about Tibet. Please notice that there is no China on this map. In the British imagination, China did not appear as a northern neighbor for us. We never, I mean the British India never recognized China as a border. Now I come to that because over a period of time you will find how Tibet disappears from the map of India, how China makes an appearance on the map of India and then finally how Tibet and China both make a reappearance on the map of India. Because a map not only tells you about what you think about the internal regime, a map is also a signifier of how you look at the areas around you. And in fact, you see, the only area which shows is the Tsangpo River, which shows that we did not know much about the areas, you know, in the geographic map, many things should be referred. But in 1950, what we find is that, you see, many of these states have already taken some sort of a shape. But, and the whole idea of organizing India on linguistic lines was put on the back burner because immediately after partition, the view that was taken by Mr. Nehru, our Prime Minister, was that, you know, and, and, and that Patel and Nehru and Sitaramaya, who was then the President of the Congress and who was from Andhra Pradesh, they felt that, all right, it's, it's, I mean, we can postpone the linguistic reorganization of the country, although the Congress had from 1918 agreed that after independence, India has to be organized on linguistic lines. That is why the Kannad Congress, the Sindh Congress, the Punjab Congress, the Bangla Congress, uh, you know, all these Congresses that come up and it was an article of faith. And let me mention here that the four great stalwarts of the freedom movement, I mean, Mahatma Gandhi, Jawaharlal Nehru, Sudhar Patel and B.R. Ambedkar, they all had a different notion of India. But all were agreed on the fact that as far as the linguistic reorganization of states is concerned, it is a must and it must be done. But it was postponed, you know, we set up a little committee which said that let's defer it for 10 years. But let's move on to the next map. Uh, uh, before that, this is the first next map. Now, this map is significant because this is the first Hindi map of the country. First time a map was made in Hindi. And apart from other things, apart from the fact that Lakadiv Islands is now called Lakshadweep, Bombay is called Mumbai, so you start getting Indian names reflected on the maps. The most interesting thing you'll find is that you find Chin up there. The word Chin appears for the first time on the geographical cartography of India. Before that, we never used the word China on our map. And the reason is very interesting. The reason is that Tibet refused to recognize India because Tibet said that, look, Sikkim, Kalimpong, and Tawang, and Darjeeling, these are part of the kingdom of Tibet. So, uh, I'm part of the Dalai Lama's, I mean, the, that Tibet. So, he says, if you don't recognize this, he won't recognize you. So, India's relations with Tibet were very frosty. Very, very frosty relations we had. Then, of course, the rest is history. By 1952, Mao had taken over. And Mao's concept of, of, of Tibet and India's concept of Tibet. In fact, you know, the three lines. In fact, I'm happy that Tilak is here. I mean, you know, the three lines, the Durand line, the Ratcliffe line, and the McMohan line, these are the lines which have defined which have defined the artificial geography of India. In fact, you know, as the, the earlier speaker had said that geography is one thing, but political mapping is another. So here what you find is that the Hindi heartland has started appearing, the word Chin has started appearing, but I must cut a long story short because you're very short on time. Let's move on. Next map, please. In 1952, there was a major agitation in Andhra when the Telugu speaking population of Madras state wanted to get out. And part of the reason was that Rajakupala Chari wanted to shift the waters of Krishna river to, uh, to, to this part of Tamil Nadu and the Telugus were very, very opposed to this. Right. So, you find here that Andhra state uh, comes into being uh, in this map. I think it comes, yeah. You know, Hyderabad ki niche, Andhra state has also started appearing in this 1953 map of India. So, Andhra state appears for the first time, but when Andhra appears, immediately after that, the state's reorganization commission uh, was established to look into the entire gamu of how do we reorganize our states. Now, the state's reorganization commission 
received 1.5 lakh memoranda throughout the country. 1.5 lakh memoranda. And they spent about two years traveling the country, receiving representations for and against. Because when they went to uh, Bihar and Ranchi, there was a delegation which told them that Jharkhand must be separate. When they went to Patna, they got another delegation which said Jharkhand should not be uh, taken away from us. So, you know, so 1956, uh, next map please. In 1956, uh, you, no, no, we moved too fast, I think. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I think let's, let's delink the map. I'll just tell you the story because it'll be difficult to connect the map because we've got very little time. So, in 1956, what happened was that <coughs> we had the four southern states. So, you got Karnataka, you got Mysore. Mysore's name did not change. Mysore continued to be called Mysore. You had Tamil Nadu or you had Madras, which still continued to be called Madras. And you had Andhra Pradesh. In Andhra Pradesh this time, Hyderabad now has become part of Andhra Pradesh. The whole of, so Hyderabad gets merged with Andhra Pradesh. In this, this is now the post-1956 map of the country. Now, <coughs> what is significant is that two other things are important before I move on. One is that lesser known idea, uh, some things which most people are not aware, that in 1954, Bihar and Bengal wanted to merge. Uh, the Chief Minister of Bengal, Dr. B.C. Roy, and the Chief Minister of Bihar, Mr. S.K. Sinha, they thought that why should we not merge Bihar and Bengal? Because they felt that, you know, this will be one very large state with the Moda Valley Corporation, the Calcutta port, and all these things. And this idea was really liked by the English press because they felt that it's a very good idea. And had that happened, perhaps the movement of a unilingual state, the whole history, course of history may have been very different. But there was a lot of opposition to this idea from the, I mean, this idea was liked by the English press. They loved this idea. Mr. Nehru loved this idea. But it got a lot of opposition from the Communist Party of India, which had a lot of base uh, amongst, the, amongst the Bengalis, uh, Bengali, especially those who'd come from Bangladesh. And Incidentally, also from the UP Congress, because UP Congress felt that that would be the end of monopoly of UP. I mean, the hegemony of UP over India's politics would disappear if you had a state which was larger than that of, uh, than that of UP. Now, why did this uh, thing come up? This came up because in 1953, uh, Mr. B.C. Roy, Dr. B.C. Roy had attended the Congress session in uh, Amritsar, where he saw the rehabilitation of Punjabi refugees. And he found that the Punjabi refugees resettlement has been pretty good because Punjab had this entire area which is now Haryana. So, Sonipat, Panipat, Bab, and you know, right up to Gurgaon. So, the settlement was very good. Unfortunately, in the case of Bengali refugees, some of them were sent to Andaman Island, some of them were sent to Dandakaranya, some of them were sent to Pilipit, some of them were sent to, to Odisha. So, the, 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 the distribution of Bengali refugees was in fact uh, is, is a great tragedy because, you know, they never had a, I mean, they never got a proper settlement. So, the idea was that perhaps they could be settled in the area which is now called Charkhand. Okay, let's move on with the story of India's maps. The next significant map is that of 1960. Uh, you know, the reasons why the SRC did not recommend, uh, I mean, the, 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 the three states, so there was a major agitation after 1950s. I mean, the South was quite happy that all right, we've got the four South Indian states. That was also the end of the Dravidian, Dravidistan uh, sort of a concept in this place. But three states are very upset. One was Assam. I mean, Assam was not upset, but, but all those who wanted an independent state within Assam, you know, the, the Khasis, the, I mean, the, 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 the Tripura, Manipur, all these people who were looking for a hill state within Assam, they were disappointed. Punjab was very disappointed because Punjabi Suba, which was being led uh, by Master Tara Singh and his group, they were very disappointed. Incidentally, I must mention uh, that when uh, the first Sikh delegation had met Dr. Ambedkar asking for a Sikh state, Dr. Ambedkar had advised them, don't ask for a Sikh state, but ask for a Punjabi Suba. Because the country cannot be reorganized on religious lines, but the country must be organized on linguistic lines. The country can be organized on ethnic lines. There is no problem as long as the larger uh, you know, construct of India is accepted. There's no problem if we have more uh, states because more states are good. Uh, you know, it's, it's very important also to realize that two significant, uh, you know, we the people of India, so we've constituted India, and then the statement that India, that Bharat, that India that is Bharat, is a union of states. So we are not the United States of Bharat. The title of my book is also We the People of the States of Bharat, to make a clear distinction between provinces which were part of British India and states which are now the creation of a new India. 
so we can therefore we could we can we can we can we can you know negotiate the territories of states but of course uh, india's uh, geography india's political territory is non negotiable so 1960 uh, we had gujarat and maharashtra come up now in 1961 goa was integrated with india uh, the reason the question that is often asked is not that goa was integrated in 19 the question that is asked is why did it take us so many years to integrate goa with us the reason is that portugal was part of nato and the earlier interpretation of nato was that any nato country fighting with anyone else there'll be intervention throughout but after the berlin wall came up in august or september of uh, of 1961 nato clarified that our intervention will only be in the north atlantic so the moment that happened within 3 days the prime minister said in the lok sabha that yes now we are ready to send in our troops so there is a lot of uh, so every incident that we find there's a lot of connect of of global politics on whatever happens within the country now i'll talk about one more state uh, i am mean, i'll talk about if i have i'll talk about more states but 63 nagaland was created in this country nagaland was a state which was created in 1963 with a population of only 3 lakhs which ran counter to the src recommendations now the src recommendation was that border states should be very strong because till the creation of bsf on 1st december 1965 the guarding of borders was the duty responsibility and mandate of the state armed police and therefore it was felt that unless the state is big enough unless the state is powerful enough unless the state is resourceful enough how will you have the state armed police so the east bengal border was to be manned by the assam police and the bengal police and this border was being manned by punjab police and rajasthan police and gujarat police so that is why he wanted very large states so all these states which were border states um, uh, the src wanted that they should be very large states but in 1963 uh, a decision was taken uh, i mean after a lot of intensive debate in the mha and i've gone through those papers beautiful notes arguments counter arguments the point that was taken was that if within assam there are ethnic groups which hate being called a part of assam but are willing to be part of india then why not negotiate why not negotiate and when there were people who were who were willing to move away from fizos faction and here a lot of credit must go to a gentleman called uh, major bob khating and i must tell you his story bob khating was a tankhul naga that is he was a naga from manipur he was a school teacher he was picked up and given the uh, given the uh, viceroy's commission in the world war he rose to the rank of a major after that he joined the assam rifles and he was the person who went and took over tawang and told those lamas there that please don't pay any tribute there tawang is a part of india the national flag flew there and that's where the dalai lama was able to come he went on to become the deputy commissioner of mokokchong in 1956 57 that is where he organized two conventions of nagas which agreed to break away from fizo and agreed to be part of india and in 1961 it became a central area then 1963 it became a it became a state full fledged state but the moment nagaland was created the moment nagaland was created it's very obvious that mizoram will also be created it's very clear then that meghalaya will also be created it is very clear that the that the that the reorganization of assam would take place so what happens is that once a political principle is accepted then that prince political principle has to go on and on and on right 63 once that happened obvious that punjabi suba had to come about so if gujarat and maharashtra the reason why gujarat and maharashtra could not i mean the major fight reason was that bombay state in fact there has been a capital dispute on almost all capital cities i mean there was a dispute on chennai because on chennai on madras because tamil thought it's their city telugu thought it is their city so the capital disputes have always been there in calcutta uh, both pakistan and india wanted uh, wanted calcutta and in that in that jamburi the expat population gave a proposal to boroughs who was then the governor says why don't you make us like hong kong and singapore so cut out both you know forget both bengals why don't you create an independent uh, independent uh, territory out of us in fact the britishers are looking at four areas in the country which they thought they might make into crown colonies uh, they were looking at andaman and nicobar islands also as crown colony they were looking at nagaland as a crown colony they were looking at calcutta as a crown colony so these are all some very interesting facets of history which are 
which probably have got buried because all the focus of history has been on looking at New Delhi and whoever has been the Prime Minister and whatever the Prime Ministers have been doing, actually history is made elsewhere. And in fact, the other, uh, so I can, uh, uh, so you know, then uh, you have 71 when Himachal and all, I'll talk to you also about the merger of Sikkim with India because that's significant because, you know, you needed two constitutional amendments to get Sikkim into India because India cannot cede an inch of its territory, India cannot acquire an inch of its territory. Therefore, POK is show, is, is a part of India, a sky chain is a part of our map. So if we, if we decide to take it, you don't need a constitutional amendment for that. But if you want to take up Moore Island, uh, you will need a constitutional amendment, right? You will need to, you will need to have a land border agreement or various things. So in any case, Sikkim, and that brings me to a very fundamental point, which is about demographics, how demographics affects politics. You see, in the year of the Lord, 1780, the Lamas of Sikkim, that is the Bhutias and the, and the Lepchas. The Lepchas, the Tibetan kingdom is actually a Lepcha kingdom, then it became a Bhutia kingdom. So they were a bit reluctant or, you know, they were so involved in the spiritual activities that they, they were a bit reluctant to till the land around their monasteries. But even monks need to eat. So they invited some people from Nepal to till, to cultivate their lands. And from 1870 to 1947, the population of Nepali stroke Gorkhas, it grew and grew and grew. And by 1947, 60% of the population of Sikkim was Nepalese. Now, Nepali Sikkimese wanted to be part of India because India had adult franchise. India was doing much better. And in the Chogyal system, there were 60 seats, 20 for the Bhutias, 20 for the Lepchas, and 20 for the Nepalese. Therefore, Sikkim became a part of India because the majority population wanted to be a part of India. So it is, I mean, of course, much later, a lot of people say it is part of India, China, rivalry, this happened or that happened. But the fact of the ground is that in 1975, 67% of the population of Sikkim was Nepalese. And therefore, let us also understand that when populations change, when demographics change, political change has to take place. We cannot avoid it. We cannot, we cannot, we cannot prevent that from happening. Anyway, 75, this happened. Then you find that in 78, all these states, I mean, Meghalaya, Mizoram, they all got their statehood. I mean, Mizoram, uh, Lal Denga, who had been fighting against India, he became the chief minister, which is a remarkable story of how India has been able to co-opt. And that's the beauty. In fact, the first title of my book was Aspirations, Assertions, and Adjustments. Because everyone aspires. Every ethnic group, every linguistic group aspires. Then they agitate. And then they adjust because nobody has got exactly what they wanted. When India in the freedom struggle, we wanted the whole of India. We didn't want Pakistan, right? But at the end of the day, you aspired for India, you agitated for it, but you adjusted with India and Pakistan. And this happens. I mean, Punjabi Suba left to themselves, they would want Chandigarh. It has never happened. Okay. Again, let's move on, speeding up history. By 2000, we got three new states of Uttarakhand, and Jharkhand. And the point that I wish to make is that by this time, there was a major political consensus in this country, a bipartisan consensus, that having small states is good for the country. You know, when in 1947, in 1947, the BJP's predecessor, the Jana Sangha, was totally opposed to small states because they felt that making small states would be doing khand khand of India and they didn't want any khands in India. That is why the preferred name for Jharkhand was Vananchal. And the preferred name for Uttarakhand was Uttaranchal. But the people wanted, uh, wanted Uttarakhand and the people wanted Jharkhand and therefore it's become that, right? So that is the thing about it. In 2014 was the next major change when Telangana was made and the principle was, this time the principle was accepted that even uh, languages other than Hindi can have more than one state. So this once Telangana has been accepted, now if there's a demand for Vidarbha, if there's a demand for North Bengal, on, 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 on ideological and philosophical grounds, it will be difficult to reject the demand only on, this, only on this principle. And in 2019, the last major cartographic change has happened in our country. Can we go to the last map, please? Uh, just the last map. Yes, sir. Last map. You know, in the last map of India, you find, just go. You see, you find that Jammu Kashmir and Ladakh are now two union territories. I must mention here that in 1948, the Ladakh Buddhist Association wanted to get out of Kashmir. 
the Ladakh Buddhist Association gave a memorandum in which they said, please join us with the Lahol Spiti area of Punjab and then with the Pori and the Teri Garwals of the then, because at that time, both of them were, were you know, were, were, were still uh, not really part of UP at that time. So they said, why don't you merge this and make it into a large buffer, uh, you know, uh, Himalayan, uh, you know, Buddhist, Himalayan, culturally, culturally, Lahol Spiti and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, Ladakh were much closer, were much closer. But by political circumstance, Lahol Spiti was part of Punjab Hill States, which later, incidentally, Punjab police was used to guard the Lahol Spiti area, uh, but, you know, till the BSF came into being, because it was part of Punjab Hill States. So friends, uh, what I want to share with you is that every now and then, the map of this country has changed. With every change in the map, I think we become strong. With every change in the map, the regional and the linguistic aspirations have gained strength. On the contrary, whichever country is not, in fact, if you look at it, where countries do not make internal changes, they break up. USSR broke up. Czechoslovakia broke up. Yugoslavia broke up. Pakistan broke up because on the 21st of February 1948, Mr. Jinnah went to the University of Dhaka and gave a speech in English that Urdu will be the sole official language of Pakistan. At that time also, East Bengal had 55% population. And that is why 18 deaths took place. That is why the International Mother Languages Day happens on the 21st of February every year. So India, I think, has been an absolute success. I mean, India's democracy has been very vibrant. We've shown that we can make linguistic, ethnic, regional aspirations. We can give them a, we can give them a political space. And when you give political space, you solve a lot of issues. I'll read the... Uh, just one sec. I'll just read the, the conclusions from my book so that, you know, it's, it's, it's easier for you. Uh, and, and then, of course, we'll have time for some questions. Uh, <coughs> I don't know if there is time for no, questions. No, we do have. Since we started late, uh, we sh okay, we'll definitely take questions from the okay. audience. So, first and foremost is the fact that the notion of identity is fluid. Now, when I say the notion of identity is fluid, it means that identity is not cast in stone. At the same time, it is not all gas. So identity is fluid. So sometimes I am a Punjabi, sometimes I'm an Indian, sometimes I'm a Hindu, sometimes I'm a Punjabi Hindu, sometimes I'm a Punjabi Sikh. So in fact, in Calcutta, I found an association called the Punjabi Jain Association of Calcutta. You know, so many, many, many multiple identities are there. So identity is fluid. And over periods of time, we get different identities. Language usually unites people. But if there is a problem with script, as happened in the case of in the case of Punjab, when Punjabi was written in, in, in Gurumukhi, Devanagari, and Shamukhi, that is Urdu, it created a major problem. Third, the way national political parties look at things is very different from the way regional parties look at things. When there is a large mass agitation, the people on the ground will not accept what the national political party is saying. In the case of Gujarat and Maharashtra, Neither the CPI, nor the Congress, nor the Jana Sangha wanted the division of Gujarat and Maharashtra. But the movement on the ground was so strong, movement on the ground was so strong that the, that the ground level people were not willing to listen to what the national political party was saying. Perspectives will vary. The English press, the Hindi press, and the regional press have a different version and a different take on all the things, I mean, on, on almost everything. So while, and even within the English press, you will notice that the business press and the, and the rest of the press uh, would have a different view. Okay. <clears throat> then I have mentioned that, you know, that every story has many perspectives. And I have highlighted that in the case of Sikkim because there are only four books on Sikkim. I mean, there are many books on Sikkim, but, you know, there are so many more books on Punjab and Haryana and Himachal and all these places. But when you read these four books on Sikkim, you realize that the perspective of the person who writes the book actually determines how the book is shaped. I am a bureaucrat, right? I'm having put in 36 in the, in, the, in the government of India. My book is going to give a very, very state perspective. It cannot be, a, it cannot be the perspective which Mr. Shekhar, uh, which, which Shekhar Patak had because Mr. Shekhar Patak is grounded in a social movement. I am grounded in bureaucracy through and through. And therefore, my perspective is based on 
maps, it's based on surveys of India, it's based on memoranda that have been given, it's based on the notes which have been made in the home ministry, it's been made on notes, factual scouts. So that is how my perspective of history comes. And there's nothing right about this perspective, there's nothing wrong about this perspective. Last but not the least, and the point that I wish to make is that as individuals, we count our life in decades. Nations have to count their life in centuries. Civilizations have to look at their lives in millennia. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.